And we'll start with politics. And this is pretty much the big story of the day. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell added his voice to the number of Republicans criticizing the RNC following a censure vote against Republicans Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. Here is some of what he had to say yesterday. Well, let me give you my view of what happened January the 6th. And we're all, we're here. We're here. We, we, we saw what happened. It was a violent insurrection for the purpose of trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power after a legitimately certified election. With regard to the suggestion that the RNC should be in the business of picking and choosing Republicans who ought to be supported, uh, traditionally the view of the National Party Committees is that we support all members of our party, regardless of their positions on some issues. The issue is whether or not the RNC should be sort of singling out members of our party who may have different views from the majority. That's not the job of the RNC. That would be putting the hammer down. Um, Joe, there are so many different um, lines to this. There was a message to the RNC, but a much bigger message that I think some could see this as a turning point. Well, you know, the thing is, people haven't wanted to hear uh, Mitch McConnell since January the 6th. He voted against impeachment. Uh, he's, he's, he voted against the January 6th bicameral committee, uh, and, and he's, he's uh, getting in the way of voting rights. So there, there are a lot of issues that uh, Mitch McConnell detractors, uh, including the court, a lot of issues uh, that uh, Mitch McConnell detractors going to bring up every time he says something here. Let's be clear, though, uh, mm -hmm. David Ignatius. Since January the 6th, Mitch McConnell has been clear and unambiguous. This was a violent insurrection. The people who committed crime should be thrown in jail. Donald Trump tried to stop a peaceful transition to power. He's a threat to democracy. McConnell has said it time and time again. And for people that were locked in the bunker, Bunker. The most liberal of liberal people that were locked in the bunker on January the 6th, they said if it weren't for Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. the voting would not have resumed on January the 6th. He was enraged. He took it personally. And others wanted to go home and said, we'll just do it tomorrow. And McConnell basically said, over my dead body, the rioters aren't going to get their way. Now, for people out there that can't handle two truths, uh, uh, you know, in, in the same space. That's fine. That's your problem. Uh, work on it. Uh, maybe do some DBT. But David Ignatius, on the issue of January the 6th, Mitch McConnell, the most powerful Republican in Washington, D.C., far more powerful than these backbenchers who are shock jocks who do rude, awful things every day. McConnell could not be any more clear. And by the way, Donald Trump's vice president, this past weekend could not have been any clearer. That's two in a week. You know, I would say something's something just may be happening in the Republican establishment. Finally, something just may be happening, but I, I, it's it's awfully tough on the basis of this limited evidence to to know whether. Trump's hold over the, the, the core of the party is, is broken. As you say, McConnell has, has, has disliked Trump, hated Trump uh, since before January 6th. He's been consistent in his statements about it. Pence has been pretty uh, solid in, in expressing his indignation about what happened. Uh, but, but those two and a few others have not been able to break through the, the a broad mass of the party. And, and the, the question I have is whether so, something really is changing in the fundamentals. Are, are Trump's poll numbers beginning to go down? Is the, the mass of evidence that the House committee investigating this is gathering uh, really becoming so significant that Republicans know that they've got to they've got to speak out, they've got to begin to change their alignment? I mean, I, 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 for me, the question is whether Mitch McConnell is, is trying to save a party that still exists. Is, is there a mainstream Republican Party left that Mitch McConnell can, can speak to? He's, he's saying the same things he said, but, but who's he saying them to? Um, all we can do is, is watch and see what other Republicans who were, who were a little more toward Trump, uh, what they had to say.
Yeah, Willie, I think uh, David's on to something here. I think that there's mounting evidence that's being accumulated by the January 6th committee. I think these senators ha who have to run statewide understand that. They know the truth is going to come out. As the Bible says, like uh, what is whispered now is going to be shouted from the mountaintops. And when that happens, when that truth comes out, when the timeline comes out, when all of America knows that Donald Trump was looking at police officers getting their brains bashed in by Trump flags, and he was rewinding the videotape to watch the most violent parts gleefully and just sat there while his closest allies, friends, everybody else, they were begging him to call off the rioters because someone might be killed. Trump did nothing. I, I, I think there's a reason. Mitch has been consistent on this point. He just has. But you're hearing Lindsey Graham. You're hearing other Republicans starting to speak out. Even uh, the guy from Missouri with the, the, the really thin bone, little bone structure. Yeah. Hawley, Josh Hawley. Even Josh Hawley saying that the January 6th people need to go to jail uh, if they were violent, committed crimes that day. That's like, you know. That's that suggests what David's saying. They're either seeing polls or they're knowing the truth is going to come out from this January 6th commission and they want to be on the right side of history. Finally. Yeah, we're seeing some leadership from Senator McConnell, as you say. We heard it from former Vice President Pence over the weekend as well. Shouldn't be a courageous act to describe exactly what happened on January 6th as what happened on January 6th, but it is in this Republican Party. There is still, though, as you say, Joe, a big portion of the party that's holding out or willing to look the other way. McConnell's comments, a marked contrast from House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who's been dodging these questions quite literally yesterday when he was pursued through the halls of Congress by ABC Congressional reporter Rachel Scott. According to Scott, McCarthy did answer a question, though, from her in a hallway earlier that day. I think there was legitimate political discourse on January 6th. Yeah, everybody knows there was getting on the broken side. Scott tweeted that McCarthy's office later had to clarify what he intended to say there, that anyone who broke inside was not engaged in legitimate hmm. political discourse, which again, Michael Steele raises the question, which part of that day was the legitimate political discourse? Was it the attempt to overturn the presidential election, if you want to put the violence to the side? But what's your read? We've always been hesitant, and we should be, based on history, about Republicans turning on Donald Trump because they always tend to turn back toward him. What's your read about what we've seen from McConnell and Pence and others the last few days? I think the key thing to understand is that the internal polling inside the RNC and other organizations that feed that information to them is showing that they're that the GOP is soft uh, on this issue. Uh, that despite uh, good efforts uh, to sort of undermine and, and take away from uh, the January 6th Commission, uh, particularly in the, in the space of going after uh, Kinzinger and, and uh, Cheney, uh, that voters uh, are are paying a little bit more attention and they're not liking what they're hearing. They're beginning to see and realize just how impactful that day was, that there was a lot more that was true about what was being said about January 6th than untrue. And, and because the untrue part is what Trump and, and his minions were putting out there. What you saw in the two leaders is a contrast in leadership. Uh, McConnell is, is concerned about uh, a Senate majority for Republicans. He's concerned about uh, Republicans taking back the House. He's concerned about Republicans creating the beachhead to go into November. Uh, McCarthy is concerned about not offending Donald Trump uh, and not getting <laughs> sideways with Trump. And, and that's the tension right now inside the GOP that's going to get played out over and over again between now and November. It is not, is not lost on anyone in town that McConnell is fit to be tied about the kind mm. of candidates that are running in Republican primaries that, that are, are pushing the narrative away from uh, inflation, Afghanistan, uh, masks, et cetera, and focusing, as Donald Trump wants it focused, on grievance around uh, the 2020 election and the January 6th commission. Here's the rub for the Democrats. They need to uh, bring it home. They need to make very clear to the American people what happened. 
and and that put that evidence out there. Um, hopefully, the Justice Department will do the right thing in, in looking at that evidence critically and pursuing it accordingly. Um, but right now, you're seeing all of these pressure points in the in this political space around what's happening on the January 6th commission and what the polling is showing on the ground that is softening voters towards uh, the Democratic view, small d Democratic view, um, about January 6th. Yeah, about January 6th, of course, Democrats uh, and, and Michael and everybody else would agree, I know, Democrats, if they want to win uh, in, in, in 22, they're going to have to be talking about not January the 6th, they're going to have to be talking about inflation, they're going to have to be talking about gas prices, they're going to have to be talking about uh, the economy, they're going to have to be talking about keeping schools open, they're going to have to be talking about keeping businesses open, uh, they're, they're going to have to talk about uh, extraordinary economic numbers that have happened over the past year in a lot of different areas. Uh, but uh, th those numbers mean very little if inflation keeps going up. Jonathan Lear, finally, let's just uh, let's let's uh, sort of dig down here a little bit in uh, a tale of, of, of two Republican leaders. You have Mitch McConnell, who is obviously concerned about getting Republican Senate candidates elected. They've got to win statewide uh, in 22 in states like Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Ohio, Wisconsin. And then you've got uh, Steve, the majority leader, uh, whatever Trump calls him, uh, McCarthy. He's got to worry about uh, his members winning in gerrymandered districts uh, where really the more intense they are, the more money they can raise. They don't have to worry about winning swing states. They just have to worry about winning their gerrymandered district. And so and, and of course, McCarthy is scared to death that Trump may endorse somebody else for the speakership undercutting his chances to be the next speaker. So if people want to know what's happening and why McConnell and Steve are responding differently the way they are, um, that, that certainly is part of that pressure, right? Yeah, the Steve thing doesn't get old. Um, I laugh every time. The uh, No, you're right. That is the inherent tension between the two Republican leaders here. You just laid it out, where McConnell needs to find candidates who can win across an entire state, where districts in a Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, some of them are deep red. The whole state's not like that. And if you go too far to the right, if your Senate candidate becomes too Trumpy, you could very well be rejected by so many of those sort of swing voters or independent voters who broke, many of them, for Trump in 16, but Biden in 20. And therefore, you lose. You wouldn't have a Republican senator, and Mitch McConnell wouldn't be majority leader. Uh, for, McCar for McCarthy, it's the exact opposite, where right now he is totally in the sway of Donald Trump, terrified uh, of upsetting him and trying to recruit candidates and support candidates. Uh, that would get Trump's backing in these gerrymandered districts. But I do think, to Michael's point, January, about the role January 6th will play in this, uh, that you know, there, we saw the limits with the Glenn Youngkin Virginia governor's race. Democrats can't just go January 6th on every race. On some, for sure. Yeah. If there are some Democrats, uh, some Republicans who are very Trumpist or supportive of that, yes, January 6th works there. But not every Republican can be so easily linked to Donald Trump. But there is a hope among Democrats, I've been talking the last couple days, that the January 6th committee, which will soon, they hope to have primetime hearings, uh, televised hearings this spring, will sort of resurface this and allow them to really paint Republicans as unfit for government. But they don't know what the attorney general is going to do. They don't know if the Justice Department is going to take any of these referrals and bring charges. And there is growing frustration uh, in the inner circle of the president about Eric, Merrick Garland and the attorney general being slow to move here. Some very close Biden advisors looking at their watches and growing very impatient, hoping for some action. That's fascinating. Well, listen, still ahead, Mika. There, there are a couple of op-eds uh, in today's oh, wow. Wall Street Journal. Uh, that actually talk about uh, the great job Joe Biden is doing, uh, not only in Europe, but also in Asia. We're going to uh, read uh, parts of both of those uh, op-eds uh, mm -hmm. from people who have been very critical of him in the past uh, and get David Ignatius's input. We'll also talk to Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin about President Biden's search for a Supreme Court nominee. Plus, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg will be our guest as the president renews his push for getting Build Back Better across the finish line. Joining us now, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Democratic Majority Whip, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. And Tom was just speaking about how someone needs to stand up and, and defend this country and its core values. 
Um, Senator Mitch McConnell yesterday has some blunt, plain-spoken words about the January 6th insurrection. Do you think that will be important as the January 6th committee tries to close in on the truth about what happened that day? Well, I think so. Let me start by saying, Mika, that was a wonderful exchange between Joe and Tom Friedman. Uh, every politician of both political parties uh, should listen to it because I think uh, they really touched some of the elements that are essential for bringing this country together. And I was uh, heartened yesterday when Mitch McConnell spoke the obvious, and the obvious is a party shouldn't be censuring Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, uh, and a party should acknowledge the obvious, and that was an insurrectionist mob that came down on this case. Capitol on January 6th. It was not some legitimate political discourse by any stretch. Maybe it's an indication that the Republican Party, the heart and soul of it, is starting to move ever so slightly towards sensibility, that the in fact the ship is leaving the sinking rat, and that we're going to have a new party and that's going to have new values that reflect Abraham Lincoln, reflect the Republican leadership which we've seen over the last few decades. Senator Durbin, good morning. It's Jonathan Lemire. Obviously, the tensions on the Russian-Ukraine border dominating global headlines now for the last few weeks. Uh, some ominous reports from U.S. defense and intelligence analysts over the last few days saying that Russia has 70 percent of the manpower and equipment it needs to go in. And if it does go in, Kiev could be toppled in a matter of days. Give us your sense of the situation here. And are you heartened by the moves in administration has taken, the Biden administration has taken to shore up alliances to try to blunt uh, Putin's aggression. I was at a meeting the other night uh, with the new chancellor from Germany, Chancellor Scholz. It was a bipartisan meeting. Uh, we had senators from both political parties, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer. And the reason for the chancellor's visit here was to show solidarity with NATO and to meet with the president and demonstrate that. Uh, Joe Biden has brought NATO back together uh, to stop the aggression of Vladimir Putin. Uh, and I think the shuttle diplomacy by Macron and others to Moscow is a positive sign. Uh, I can't believe that Putin is going to go through with this madness, although he prepares uh, to do so on the border. Uh, he has to realize that if he wants to be respected in the, in the body of functioning nations, war is not a tool that you use regularly or a threat of war in your tool chest. That seems to be his recourse to every challenge in Russia. Senator Durbin, good morning. I want to ask you a question in your role as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that is about the Supreme Court nomination process, where it stands right now. Obviously, President Biden made that campaign promise that he would put a black woman on the Supreme Court. Judges Childs, Kruger, and Brown seem to be the front runners. Can you offer any more insight into the president's thinking about who he may nominate here and then just kind of lay out the process? How long do you expect it to take? Well, I can tell you that uh, we've seen those three names and, and looked at them carefully, and every single one of them points to something that is significant. Each of these black women have achieved things in life which very few have ever achieved. They are the first of their uh, class in, in so many uh, respects, and that tells me that we're going to get a remarkable nominee. But I'm not confining it to those three. The president uh, may have others that he's interviewing and considering. We have urged him to do it in a thoughtful way, but to do it uh, in a timely way. We'd like to get this done before the Easter recess. Uh, if the president reports a nominee to us soon, it's going to make that a little easier to achieve. Do you expect, Senator, to get Republican votes here? Uh, Judge Brown, just last June, got a small handful of them. Um, have you talked to your Republican colleagues, people like Lisa Murkowski, people like Lindsey Graham, about whether they were open, at least, to the president's nominee? Well, it's in the best interest of the Senate as well as the Supreme Court to have bipartisan support for the new nominee, particularly the first black woman on the court. Uh, and I haven't ruled that out, and I don't think many of my Republican friends have ruled it out either. They are open-minded. They want to meet the nominee, ask the important questions. That's our responsibility. But if we can achieve a bipartisan roll call, it will be a step forward in kind of healing this country and moving us in the right direction. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm curious, Senator, uh, where are we uh, on voting rights? Uh, we, of course, uh, were reminded again this past week with the Supreme Court decision regarding Alabama, uh, a desperate need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in the House and pass a similar bill in the Senate. Uh, how do we get there from here? Well, I can tell you the disappointment I felt, and I sense it in your comments, 
that the Supreme Court voted five to four, Roberts joining the three liberals on the court, uh, and, and basically decided that they would not stay the Alabama congressional map, which was found to be discriminatory against black voters by a panel in Alabama. The federal panel that, that decided that, two of the three judges were Trump appointees, and they reached that conclusion. And yet the Supreme Court, by a five to four decision with uh, no explanation, uh, decided not to stay any implementation of that map. It's an argument, the strongest possible argument, for restoring the Voting Rights Act and, and reversing the Heller decision. Unfortunately, two Democrats voted against our rules change, and that stopped us in our tracks. But we shouldn't quit. This is really a fundamental issue of the right to vote in a democracy. Um, and un unfortunately, the court moving uh, away from basic voting rights. Uh, you, the Roberts court uh, traditionally has always deferred to states in, 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 in matters like this. No more, which, of course, makes your work all the more important, again, <clears throat> on an issue that every single Republican voted for 15 years ago. Senator Dick Durbin, as always, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it.